Kura Kato Kato, everyone. Um, welcome to our second uh, NZILA Streetscape webinar for uh, 2021. Um, firstly, just thanks to Streetscape who have been uh, extremely supportive of these online early learning opportunities um, for us, and we thank them for their ongoing support. Um, it's great for us to be able to bring quality speakers uh, like Kate Orff uh, last time round and today, uh, Sinye Nielsen. Uh, and we'll just have a, a brief word from Street, Streetscape now to kick us off. Streetscape is New Zealand's leading manufacturer of quality street furniture, lighting poles, shelters, and sculptures that breathe life into our open space environments. Collaborating with landscape architects and designers to share our manufacturing expertise and experience, we create solutions to meet your design brief, your budget, and your project delivery deadline. At Streetscape, we have a great range of off-the-shelf furniture, Together, we can modify and customize our existing ranges to suit, or we can provide the design support to manufacture fully bespoke furniture for your project. With all furniture proudly manufactured in New Zealand from locally and ethically sourced materials, and with over a hundred years of combined experience, you can be sure of the craftsmanship. Quality products made to withstand our unique environmental conditions while meeting all local health and safety standards. Local doesn't just mean local knowledge and local jobs. It also means reduced lead times and a local team who manage every step of the way with you to see the project from your concept through to final delivery. Aotearoa New Zealand, these are our places, our communities, our environments and we want you to enjoy them the way you imagine them. That's why we go that extra mile every time. Streetscape, turning your imagination into reality. Streetscape, in conjunction with the NZILA, are proud to sponsor the Streetscape Speaker Series. So thanks again to Streetscape for their ongoing support. Um, just in terms of the talk today, um, there'll be some time for question, questions and answers at the end of the presentations. Um, so if you have any questions, please put these into the Q&A menu using the icon uh, located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and look, to get going, it's it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker for today's webinar. Um, Sinye Nielsen has been practicing as a landscape architect and urban designer in New York since 1978. Uh, her body of work has renewed the environmental integrity and transformed the quality of spaces for those who live, work and play in the urban realm. Um, Ms. Nielsen is a Professor of Urban Design and Landscape Architecture at Pratt Institute in both the graduate and undergraduate schools of architecture and currently serves as President for the Public Design Commission of the City of New York. Uh, born in Paris, Ms. Nielsen holds degrees in urban planning from Smith College and Landscape Architecture from City College of New York and in construction management from Pratt Institute. Uh, today, Sinye will provide us with an overview of the Little Island Project in New York, a $363 million maritime botanic garden, which opened in um, mid-2020 after four years of planning and three of construction, uh, followed by a more in-depth discussion on topography, microclimate, microclimate uh, and planting design. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce to everyone Sinye. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, this is the first time in my life um, that I've ever put two dates on a presentation since it's tomorrow for you. Uh, so good day and thank you for uh, joining us. Um, I am going to try to uh, give you an overview of Little Island. It uh, was originally called Pier 55 and I'll explain that in uh, just a second. Um, and, you know, please don't hesitate to throw questions in the chat and I'll do my best to answer uh, at the end. Now, let's just see if I can get this going here. Mm -hmm. Why is this? There we go. Um, 
So the site of the of the pier was a, a former uh, passenger ship uh, terminal uh, for the sort of the heyday of the passenger ships. It was badly destroyed in a hurricane uh, back in 2012. Uh, and so there was really nothing left of it. And uh, the, the owner of the property, the Hudson River Park Trust, that owns uh, all of the west side of, uh, of Manhattan uh, from the water uh, perspective, uh, asked um, a, a donor uh, whether he would be interested in contributing to the reconstruction uh, of this pier. And so uh, he said yes. And uh, he called upon the services of Thomas Heatherwick of Heatherwick Studios in London. Uh, and he envisioned uh, a scheme uh, that looks like this. And this was a rendering from uh, 2014. The project actually began in 2013, which is when uh, we came on board. And so you can see that it sits between um, the two pile fields uh, that used to exist of what is Pier 54 and Pier 56, hence giving this the name uh, Pier 55. Uh, over time, it's changed its name to a little island, although it is anything but an island. But what am I supposed to say? Um, this is it in uh, 2021. So here it is built. Uh, it opened in May of, of this year. And I think it's just kind of remarkable if you just go back a second, how, how uh, little it has uh, changed in its, in its vision. Now, a couple of things uh, to just point out from this image here, most of our, all of our peers are connected to land. Um, and this is the first time a pier is, is set off from the shore. And it's done uh, so specifically uh, to make it uh, resilient to uh, sea level rise and storms because you actually go up uh, more than three meters from the elevation of this esplanade uh, to the uh, lowest elevation uh, of the pier. So that is, um, that is the reason for these bridges but also psychologically, uh, they are a way to kind of um, uh, start you on a journey uh, of leaving the city. So the concept that I had from the outset was of a leaf floating on water. This was a, uh, an, um, really the inspiration for the landscape as it, as it evolved. So these were just some of the early uh, sketches as to why uh, the pier is located where it is. It is the exact same footprint of square footage uh, of the pier that was demolished. And so uh, it was a, a, a square was selected instead of a rectangle, which is what the shape of all of our uh, piers, because that was really much more conducive to the kind of program that the donor envisioned, which is a, a blending of art and culture uh, with some uh, performance spaces and so um, the idea was to, uh, it was more amenable to make it a square. So then the question was, where is that square going to be placed? And it could have been placed as in the top image over the pier that was demolished uh, or placed between the two pile fields, oops, sorry, and then uh, rotated uh, so that it aligns with the street grid of that part of Manhattan. So you could see past the pier on this street and also on this street. So that's just some citing criteria. Um, this is a, again, a rendering from uh, 2013. Uh, the bridges were always a part of the plan, um, but you'll notice that the circulation has changed rather significantly uh, as has the um, landscape. This rendering from 2014 though uh, is, is quite interesting because right from the outset, there was a notion of how this structure was gonna be formed uh, and what we call the pots or those unusual uh, uh, shapes, mushrooms, uh, champagne flutes, tulips, they have all kinds of different names. We just called them pots for short. Um, so there it was in 2014 and there it is today. So uh, it, is, it is quite remarkable how that uh, uh, in initial vision has remained intact uh, for all of these uh, years of design. I um, wanted to just uh, walk you through kind of the program that's on the pier. It's not a heavily programmed uh, pier at all. Um, 
if you can see my mouse, which I hope you can. Um, so you can arrive by what we call the South Bridge here or the North Bridge here. The South Bridge actually takes you underneath the pots and you arrive into a large uh, paved space that I will refer to as the plaza. The next sort of largest space is a, is a proper amphitheater uh, with a thrust stage. Uh, and then toward the uh, bottom of the image uh, is another smaller uh, performance area that we call uh, the Southern stage or now the sort of catchy phrase of the glade. There are also three um, high points in the park, uh, one on the Northwest, one on the Southeast and one at the Southwest. And those are kind of the destinations that uh, people are always seeking to, to arrive at. The, the circulation on the pier has, has very much evolved. It is all uh, made accessible um, through these routes following the United States uh, uh, Accessibility Code, uh, which for those of you who are landscape architects is 8.33%. Um, what I've uh, done here is show you some early renderings because I think it's always fun to um, compare uh, you know, original intent uh, with uh, future uh, design. So the top rendering was done by uh, Heatherwick Studio. The bottom rendering was done by us, but these are uh, very early on. So as you can see, um, the studio was more interested kind of in the uh, topography and the spatial characteristics. And we were more interested in rendering the plant material uh, more, uh, more accurately. Uh, then I thought you might enjoy seeing some of the process uh, photos while it was uh, under construction. So this is a view uh, essentially from the Southwest looking uh, Northeast toward the main uh, plaza that is in the process of being uh, paved over here. Uh, and this is it uh, complete uh, as of June of this year. So that, that plaza, while it has the capacity uh, to serve as another performance area where a stage could be brought in and chairs could be set up on the paved surface, as well as people on the lawn that you see in the foreground of the image, um, it is uh, in this uh, first six months of being open, is, is really been more for a place for people to just hang out, grab a bite to eat, get a glass of wine uh, and enjoy being outside. Um, the amphitheater, which was a, a very big driver of the original concept of performance on the, on the pier. This was a, a very early rendering from uh, 2013. It faces the sunset, uh, the Hudson River, uh, the skyline of New Jersey, which believe it or not, there is one actually, uh, and uh, seats about 800 uh, people. Uh, this is it uh, while it was uh, under construction. Uh, you're looking north in this view. And this is it uh, today. Um, the, um, it was very interesting to hear the, uh, the sponsor's uh, video at the beginning of this. Uh, I, was, I was pleased to hear them talk about sustainably harvested materials and, and such. And so uh, for, this, for this pier, uh, all of the wood that we use uh, is a domestic hardwood called a black locust, which is not a very uh, handsome tree, but it does produce very um, uh, durable rot resistant wood. So, uh, and, the, and the fabricators are, are, are come from Brooklyn. So uh, uh, coincidentally, uh, uh, many of the uh, uh, fabricators uh, of and materials for the pier uh, were sourced from New York State. Uh, and I was lucky enough to attend the first performance uh, in the amphitheater uh, with that magnificent um, backdrop of the lights and the river, watching the sun go down. Uh, the acoustics are, are quite good, except when helicopters go by. Um, but uh, it's a, it is a very um, uh, sophisticated amphitheater in terms of the uh, um, acoustics and, and lighting. Now underneath that uh, a stage and underneath um, the pier is a, a rather large service area, uh, which you would not otherwise uh, uh, have access to um, the, unless you have a pass to go in. And so this is the, uh, uh, the underside of the amphitheater, which is a, 
all used for storage. And then this uh, section here, uh, there are public restrooms uh, right here. And then all of this area here is actors support space with changing rooms and costume rooms and, and such. So it is a, a very, it, it can uh, handle very um, sophisticated performances. And the views under there, which the public sadly doesn't get to see, um, are really kind of uh, magnificent, especially the view up underneath uh, the, uh, the structure. There's also a, a, a boat ramp here. Uh, so you can pull in a barge if we need extra uh, capacity for uh, the theater productions. So I wanted to uh, speak a little bit about like what, what did our firm contribute to this project? Clearly not the vision, um, but really the, the, um, the hardscape and the landscape. So when um, the original Heatherwick scheme is what you see here uh, on the screen where there was really only one way up and the same way down uh, from all of the high points. And I was concerned because we have, while it's a beautiful precedent, uh, has its uh, challenges and that is the High Line. The High Line um, really uh, only allows you to move in uh, either north or south and you have to retrace your steps. So I wanted people to have a alternate experience, assuming they were able-bodied, uh, to be able to uh, get up or down using stairs uh, in addition to the accessible uh, routes. So in thinking about how the circulation would work and what would be the experience on those paths, we spent a lot of time analyzing the views, the views out to the river, the views back to the city, the views internal to the park. Uh, and so that's what these uh, studies were about. We also looked at, at from different elevations in the pier because there is a, is a significant elevation change Let's see, it's, um, uh, 16. it's about uh, 14 meters from the plaza level, uh, which is this here, to the highest point, uh, which is here. And so there is a tremendous amount of topography uh, in, this, uh, in this pier. So we wanted to kind of evaluate when uh, you were uh, walking and traversing this topography, when you would be able to see the river, the skyline, uh, and so that's what these studies are about. And then this is the final circulation plan. Um, so uh, let me just point out, um, you can see a set of stairs here. You can see another set of stairs uh, going down here, another set here, here, here. So there's a, a lot of stairs uh, have been added. So there's always at least, as I said, two ways up and down. Uh, from each of the uh, destinations. Um, the, um, the, the plaza paving uh, is a, a series of um, kind of loosely concentric circles uh, of a, a finely graduated um, uh, a color scheme uh, from lightest in the center uh, to darkest on the outside. And you see with, they sort of are blended uh, together. It was a real uh, uh, craftsmanship on the part of the uh, uh, stonemasons who, who did this. Uh, and then this is it uh, completed from various different angles, sometimes with the shade structures open and sometimes closed. Uh, you'll see these uh, dark uh, pavers. Um, we kind of liken them to schools of fish <laughs> that uh, 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 much like um, uh, the design of the paving is, is much like dropping a pebble in a, in a pond and it ripples out. And so we sort of went on with that analogy uh, and, uh, and uh, made these kind of schools of fish. They are uh, actually the only thing that is imported from England uh, and they are um, made out of uh, a, a very densely compressed uh, coal product actually. Um, this is a rendering of uh, what the paving of the paths uh, looks like. So it is a, um, a cast in place concrete with a, an exposed aggregate topping. It has a weathering steel edge and the railings in keeping with this concept of a warm palette of materials, which was the decision that we finally arrived at. Um, we obviously had looked at cool metals, uh, cool grays, cool metals, and then uh, warm uh, stones, warm 
uh, metals and, and selected the warm metals uh, ultimately. Um, and so it's very difficult to come up with a, a warm metal. Uh, we looked at ways to um, uh, change the color of uh, stainless steel, uh, but nothing really uh, would do that effectively and durably. Uh, we obviously looked at galvanized metal and outer coat surfaces, but in the end, we um, opted for red brass or what was more commonly known of as bronze. So they are a very expensive uh, uh, contribution to the beer, let's put it that way. Uh, this is the, uh, these are the pads uh, under, uh, under construction. Uh, the gentleman on the lower left uh, is a true craftsman. He is the person responsible for uh, scattering the pebbles uh, very consistently and evenly throughout uh, all of the pads. And we, of course, paid meticulous attention uh, to be sure that the pads uh, were built as designed in terms of their, uh, their slopes. Uh, and here they are complete. Uh, and so um, here's a, an example of a, of a view where, you're, where your orientation uh, has you looking down and focused on, on the park. Um, the stairs uh, were um, the, a, a later addition, as I said, uh, really about in 2017, we, we added the stairs into the plan uh, and we, uh, uh, chose a black locust again, uh, same material as the as the stairs. Uh, sorry, the seats in the amphitheater, um, and uh, they are uh, a very kind of um, coarse and uh, and rustic in their in their characteristic. Uh, here are the stairs being built. I will say that to achieve uh, some of the uh, topography within the pier. Uh, we used a, a lot of geofoam or maybe what you would call styrofoam uh, in order to reduce the weight uh, on, the, on the piles. And so uh, the, uh, much of the landscape is uh, on top of this uh, white material, which is a type of styrofoam. Uh, this is the, um, the southern stage or the glade as we call it, uh, completed. Uh, this is a small performance area. It can has a capacity of about 60 people sitting on uh, these uh, three tiers of seating. And then there's additional capacity on the sloping uh, lawn beyond. And then you see the staircase uh, as it goes up alongside. So people can still circulate uh, even though there is a performance uh, going on in this little space. Um, this uh, The seating throughout the park is made by the same uh, with the same wood uh, as, as elsewhere, and uh, was made by the same uh, craftspeople in um, in Brooklyn. And each each bench is bespoke uh, in its in its proportion, uh, as well as the number of legs uh, that they have. Um, none of them have just four legs, as you can see. Even a teeny little seat such as this, so it feels more like a forest, if you will, or a cloud that's being held up. Um, there are lots of uh, other seating opportunities. Uh, you can sit on the on the uh, terraced lawn. You can sit on the uh, movable uh, chairs in the plaza. You can sit on these large uh, boulders um, that uh, are also sourced from uh, New York State. It's a it's a, a form of a, a granite. Um, then the real challenge for us was how to deal with the um, the slopes because while we could get accessible roots up, how are we going to hold the soil? And so you can just, even though you have no scale to work with here, you can see how close a lot of those contour lines are. And so uh, my, my sort of um, biggest fear uh, throughout the design of this project was that one day I would wake up after a bad rain and all of the <laughs> slopes would have ended up here in the plaza. And so, um, we, we looked at uh, a number of different, well, first of all, we determined where we needed retaining walls, which is what is shown in this plan here. And the legend on the, on the right shows you the height and some of them are fairly significant. Um, and then uh, came the dis discussion about what should these, be wall what should these walls uh, be made of. And so we had looked at the gabion, which is a uh, rock filled uh, metal baskets. 
but we determined after a while that that really took up too much horizontal distance in the, in the landscape. Uh, we also looked at something that was kind of ludicrous, uh, which was large slabs of stone. Um, a, this is hopelessly expensive. And second of all, um, put too much load again uh, onto, the, uh, onto the piles that are supporting um, the structure. So then we uh, uh, thought and thought and decided that at the end of the day, why not use an off the shelf product that is historically used uh, in marine construction and that is sheet pile. So we found a manufacturer uh, that makes uh, sheet pile in weathering steel. So that is what we have here. It's a, a regular off the shelf product uh, and uh, is only a half an inch thick. So we really were able to maximize uh, the amount of landscape. I will say that the donor wasn't all that enthusiastic about this material um, because he felt it was a little bit too um, industrial. Uh, and so I promised him that uh, the landscape would uh, either spill over the top or uh, would grow up from the bottom uh, and, the, and the weathering steel would be uh, minimized. And I'm pleased to say that has proven to be the case. This is obviously a rendering. Um, here are the uh, sheet piles uh, being installed. Uh, the sort of sequence was uh, once the slab was poured that holds all of the pot structures together as a single uh, sort of seismic unit. Uh, we then um, uh, uh, put in the trees, uh, sorry, we put in the sheet pile. Uh, then the sheet pile in a lot of cases is holding the soil uh, for these uh, very uh, sizable trees uh, and then backfilled with more soil. And then came the shrubs, the perennials, grasses, and, and finally the, the bulbs. So uh, here you can see some examples of how we are uh, using plants to cascade over the walls and vines uh, to grow up the um, grow up the sheet pile. So it's uh, oh, I think we have uh, managed to um, minimize their appearance. Even though I personally think that the juxtaposition of this um, really rich brown and green look marvelous together. Um, now. Um, since you're all landscape architects, you probably care more about this part of the uh, talk than what I just did. But um, how did we establish the, the planting palette? Uh, and so this is just um, showing you some of the criteria that we used uh, to make that determination. So we looked at sun uh, because we have very different solar exposures uh, because of the topography, the wind, which we know our prevailing wind direction which is pretty consistent in, in New York. And then we have um, slopes, uh, the severity of them, uh, and then their uh, relative elevation, which is both uh, an influencer of solar exposure and, and wind exposure. And from that, uh, we uh, develop these, um, uh, these zones as we call them. And then from there, we began to think about, well, sort of what are the ecotones or what are some of the natural uh, examples uh, and, and typologies of landscape that, that uh, this uh, peer might want to um, think about emulating. And so we have these general uh, typologies of a woodland garden, a hilltop, and a coastal meadow. So we began to study uh, their, their solar condition, their slopes, et cetera, et cetera. And so we began to then uh, refine the, the thinking on uh, the plant selection. We did the same thing for uh, the tree buffers because we wanted you to feel as you moved around the park that you were moving through very distinctive spaces and you couldn't see one performance area from another performance area. We wanted that to be kind of an exploration, if you will. Uh, so we have tall and thin buffers, thick and dense and soft and and textured uh, buffers. So again, we looked at uh, all of the criteria uh, uh, for these as well. Then um, one of the things I, I really had to educate both the architects and my client about is what can you do on slopes that are this steep? Not only what can people do, but what can plants do? And so this was a, a matrix where we essentially explained that when you have really severe slopes, as in this group right over here, we can't even plant large trees. 
because we can't get the root ball in on a slope that is that uh, steep. So this began uh, to uh, drive uh, also um, the, the thinking and the, and the design. These are uh, uh, sections that, that are now uh, essentially as built, if you will. And I, I wanted to just use this to point out a couple of things. One, that the, um, the slope of the slab that ties all the pots together is not reflected in the slope of the soil above it. So you see there's some areas where it's very, very thick uh, and some areas where it's much thinner, but <laughs> they are not in a parallel uh, relationship. Uh, this is the undercroft that I was speaking about, the um, actor's support space. And then here is where we have all of that styrofoam. So we don't have styrofoam everywhere, but in this particular place, uh, we have a substantial amount underneath a, a sloping lawn, which for which we only have about um, ooh, uh, 12 inches, of, uh, about a third of a meter. Um, this is just to show you a sequence of how uh, this, uh, this works. Let me just go back for a second. So what we're looking at in this next image is this corner right here. Uh, so you can see uh, that there is some amount of styrofoam used, not where the tree itself is. Here is the tree now installed uh, with the soil. Uh, and then you see it now with the, uh, with the turf placed on top of it. And then another view of it, uh, uh, looking back, that tree is this tree right here that you see. So uh, it's a very exposed location, uh, gets a great deal of sun. Uh, and, uh, and each tree was um, uh, geolocated. Uh, and so the trees are actually uh, cabled to the deck itself uh, so that uh, there, is, there, was no, um, there was no mystery as to where the trees had to be placed. They were, they were located relative to the um, uh, soil volume, soil depth. Uh, and and then where the cables were placed to anchor them into into place. Um, these are just some statistics. Um, I won't uh, bore you by reading them, um, but it it just gives you a sense of uh, the the number of um, uh, species that we have on the on the pier. There are a, a great deal of them, um, and also just uh, basic quantities. Um, I was I'm often asked how many of these are are native, uh, and it really depends on what we're speaking about, uh, trees, shrubs, perennials, grasses, um, they vary. They vary from 50% native, as in perennials, to 70 to 80% native uh, for the grasses uh, and, the, and the trees. Oops, what happened here? Um, so I, I think you'd, <coughs> excuse me, enjoy enjoy this. So this is the final planting plan. Uh, and we you're looking at essentially three different types of trees illustrated here, large canopy trees in this olive green, uh, understory flowering trees in the sort of lime green, and then uh, evergreen trees in the sort of dark olive. So here again, we uh, uh, pointed out that um, on uh, different slopes, we can accommodate different calipers of uh, tree. Uh, and the donor, uh, not a young man, um, wanted this uh, landscape to look as mature as possible on opening day. And so we were asked to plant um, some very sizable trees, as you will see. Uh, I, we did a, uh, a growth comparison, as one often does, uh, as to how the uh, park would look in year one and in year five. Uh, and you can see that um, he wanted the ground plane uh, really to look mature on day one. Uh, and yes, the trees will uh, grow, but they are not insignificant on, on day one. And he was willing to pay for that, which I have to say, not every client is. So this is the, um, as, I, as I said before, the slopes were really a major uh, design driver and sort of the deeper the, the red and the black, the, the greater the uh, slope. So this really then, as I said, drove our, uh, drove our retaining wall placement. Um, we also then did a study of uh, how much soil 
we could place over the piles. The pots themselves could take a lot of load. That wasn't the challenge. The challenge was that those pots sit on columns uh, or piles that are driven uh, down into the rock at the river bottom. And uh, so that's what, this is a, a study of how much uh, soil depth um, that these uh, various pots, excuse me, piles uh, could, could take. Notice that we have the greatest soil volume capacity where we don't need it in the amphitheater. Um, so we did our planting plan. Uh, we sent it uh, to the structural engineers. Uh, they came back and they said, uh, this is the amount of soil volume that we'll let you put in those locations. So every tree in red uh, is a tree that does not have enough soil. <laughs> and uh, those are in feet. Uh, so you can see that uh, some of them are just missing a little bit of soil, a quarter of a foot, but some of them are missing as much as two feet, you know, or 60 centimeters of uh, soil. So we really had a problem. The only thing that worked were the trees in green. So that's not a very high proportion. So we then spent the next year uh, um, working with uh, the Heatherwick studio to change the, the profile uh, of the pots, uh, working with the structural engineers to see if we could move load around and then evolving our planting design uh, so that we could uh, get the, the proper uh, soil depth and volume. So what we ended up doing is working in three dimensions because the plan view was just not working out at all. So we modeled the root balls, uh, as you can see here. Uh, the green mean that we have enough soil. The red mean that we don't have enough uh, soil depth. The pink are the retaining walls. The orange are the stairs and the gray is the path. So um, we went back and forth and back and forth. Sometimes we, we uh, reduced the size of a tree. Sometimes we moved the tree. Sometimes we um, uh, moved um, a path. Uh, we did all different kinds of things to make this happen, but it did take a it did take a full year to resolve this. And so here is uh, finally planting day comes. Uh, these trees are enormous, uh, and uh, you can see the size of the root ball relative to the gentleman standing around. Um, they all had to be craned into place. Um, some of them uh, weighed as much. Oh dear, I can't do that that quickly in my head. Um, they weighed twenty thousand pounds. Um, and uh, uh, were, in, were and all craned into place. So here you see them. This is, uh, I thought you'd be interested. This is the strapping system um, that is used. Uh, it's placed on top of the root ball. You can see them installing the strapping system here. Here you see the cables. And these cables, as I said, are uh, anchored uh, to the um, uh, concrete deck. Um, we started planting on the east side in May of 2020. This project was uh, in full construction uh, all throughout the pandemic in, in New York City, but because we were uh, working outside, we were uh, allowed to continue uh, construction. Uh, we uh, finished the Northeast by, uh, by June, uh, the Northwest by July, and uh, in, by October, uh, we finished the uh, southwest um, tree planting. Um, the, the lighting design uh, is really magnificent. I, I take absolutely no credit for it. Um, it, is, uh, it is based largely on uplighting of the structure, the pots, uh, as well as uplighting uh, of the trees. And it really is uh, magical at night. Uh, the stairs are also, uh, and the paths are uh, lit with uh, under railing lights. Uh, as you can see the, uh, on this uh, upper right image, uh, the plaza, because there are no uh, trees in the center, there are some pole lights, which you can barely discern here. Um, but it, it is, a, a, a for a New York City park, it is um, less well lit than most of our city parks. It's a much more romantic, atmospheric kind of lighting than you would find in most of our New York City uh, parks. Uh, this is the approach under the uh, south bridge and you walk underneath the pots that are uh, uplit, which is very uh, dramatic here. You can see the silhouette of the trees uh, that are uh, uplit. And it even works in the winter when they're 
when there aren't leaves on, on the majority of the trees. Uh, there it is at uh, the north uh, and uh, northeast. Uh, you also get some interesting shadows uh, off, of the, um, off of the river. Um, now I wanted to talk a little bit um, more about the experiences and the programming and how that merged with uh, the landscape. So uh, I, I pointed out these sort of big uh, programmatic uh, areas, but one of the things that struck me is after we did all that study of uh, the different zones and uh, whatnot, I was concerned that, that the project at the end of the day might look a bit um, uh, dis, um, uh, uh, not united, not, not well integrated. So we came up with this idea called the bloom sweep, which is this sort of lavender circle that uh, unites the four uh, distinctive uh, quadrants of the pier that are distinctive for a host of reasons, everything from topography to solar access to wind, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so within the bloom sweep, which this is really what it uh, looks like uh, on the ground, there is a consistency of, uh, of color, uh, and plant material so that the, uh, when you first enter the park, it feels like an integrated whole and not a series of kind of one-off destinations. We did a lot of study uh, on what the bloom sweep could be. And this is just one area. I'll just point out that area. It's down here by the stairs. And we were studying this area specifically. Uh, and we were um, looking to see how many a different species of uh, plants it would take to create uh, uh, a maximum amount of bloom. So we studied this in the early spring, uh, early uh, late spring, early summer, et cetera, et cetera, and midsummer, uh, late summer, and early autumn. So those were the sort of four seasons uh, that we um, that we looked at, and and how could we, uh, you know, did we have enough? Uh, would this idea hold together? It was essentially what we were studying here. Um, so the uh, the original plant palette was based on this notion, as I said, uh, of ecotones, and we would make reference uh, to what these ecotones were. Uh, a lot of this we understood, um, but we needed to convey it to the architects and uh, to the donor. Um, this is a uh, uh, we did renderings for. Uh, all the seasons, including uh, our winter, uh, to show what this bloom sweep would look like, what would be the experience upon uh, entering the park, uh, and how would you uh, actually screen the amphitheater. So the amphitheater is just on the other side of these uh, trees here. Um, they are really a beautiful uh, uh, tree. It's, a, it, it's an unusual kind of tree. It's, it's a deciduous evergreen. I mean, it has needles, but it's deciduous. Um, it's called a meta sequoia, in case you have that. Um, so I just, just point out here that when we made this presentation to the donor, um, he, uh, he looked at me and he said, you know, Signe, I hate the color purple. <laughs> so after all of the effort I had gone into to make this bloom sweep purple, why it's been rendered in purple and diagrammed in purple, um, I picked purple because it is a color that reliably blooms uh, in our climate from um, uh, March uh, through November. Uh, but he said, I don't like that color. So then we had to come up with a completely different concept. So here you see, I've rendered it in a, a different uh, color. Um, and we then changed all the renderings uh, and to accommodate that. So since I couldn't come up with another color that, that blooms uh, continuously for those uh, months, I decided that I would just change the entire idea and that the, <clears throat> the spring would sort of be pastel, the summer would be hotter colors and the fall would be more muted uh, uh, tones. So that, that is in fact uh, what, we have, what we have done. And this is the sort of rough uh, tonality. Uh, it's, it is it really a diagram, um, but there are, uh, uh, there is one part of the uh, garden which is uh, very, which is unique, and that is this area down at the lower uh, right uh, in lime green, 
It is uh, what we call a moon garden. Everything in there blooms white. Uh, all the rest of the spaces are uh, multiple uh, colors. Uh, again, we looked at the seasonal structure. What would it look like in the, in the spring when very little would be blooming other than bulbs? What would it feel like in the summer when everything is kind of intense? In the fall where the trees and the shrubs begin to have really uh, dramatic uh, seasonal uh, foliage? And then what would it look like in the winter? And we do have a kind of a shelter belt of evergreens along the north edge and along this northeast corner because it's adjacent to a highway and we wanted to screen that highway. Uh, otherwise, we just have a smattering of evergreen trees uh, here and then uh, a lot of evergreens that are used uh, on the retaining walls. Uh, and then I'm going to show you uh, in a sequence here uh, our final four uh, seasonal renderings that are very accurate to what has been planted. So you can see here the spring is largely of the pastels, uh, including the, the flowering trees. Uh, that are down here on the on the south. Uh, the summer colors, it's particularly hot uh, in this uh, north uh, west where there's full blasting sun on this uh, uh, slope. Um, the autumn is is truly beautiful. I was there today uh, and we've got some trees that really are extremely expressive of the fall color and the grasses of course take on some lovely uh, uh, golds and beiges. And then the winter uh, showing the evergreens and, and some shrubs that have some uh, nice, uh, nice bark uh, and berries as well. So I just wanted to quickly, this is, how are we doing on time? 6.48, I should be done by now, shouldn't I? Oh dear, um, I'm gonna go through this really quickly. Uh, Northeast uh, corner built, uh, color palette of the Northeast, uh, a view of the, plaza from across the way, the Northwest with the really hot colors, some sketches that we did to figure out what the views and experience would be, uh, renderings and built. Uh, and here you see the grasses are really magnificent in this area. Um, and we'll just move along here. Some of the um, really hot color uh, plants that are used in this quadrant. Um, very hot colors. I love this quadrant, it's my personal favorite. Um, look at that, isn't that so beautiful between July and today? Uh, southeast quadrant, uh, which is the, that performance, small performance area and lawn. Again, some studies of what you would feel and see from the paths, uh, renderings and uh, the built condition uh, with another a set of uh, stone steps, the view of it from a bit of a distance, uh, planting and view up at it. Uh, now uh, the, the sort of um, overlook that you have uh, uh, from that point. And this is a, really how the planting works. So there's the edges are 70% grasses, 30% perennials. And then as you move away from the edges, it becomes roughly 80% perennials to 20% grasses, just as a rough set of proportions. Some of the colors in this area are the golds and purples and lavenders. And then the white garden, uh, what I call the moon garden, uh, some of the plants that are in uh, that garden. And then the last quadrant, the Southwest. Um, all of these were uh, studies done in Rhino using the program Rhino renderings, uh, built condition is very high. Uh, some of the uh, pastels in the, um, in the early spring, uh, very inward looking views, outward looking views as you uh, ascend the path. Uh, and then of course the sort of blockbuster view of the harbor uh, at, the, at, the, at the high point. And some of the uh, color schemes, trees and shrubs, uh, woodland kind of quality. Um, and then uh, my conclusion, uh, I hope you can come uh, to New York and enjoy uh, the natural beauty and, um, uh, or you can stay and enjoy the many cultural offerings, some of which you can 
do yourself. Uh, it's a very impromptu and summer schedule. So, uh, and we've had over a million visitors in four months. So do come, I'll give you a tour. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Sunyi. What a, um, a really beautiful, um, innovative, and um, obviously highly technical um, project. So um, thank you for sharing that. And um, we've got a few questions coming through, but I might just sort of kick off a little bit. I, I mean, it seems to be that there's a tradition that, of sort of recent New York public realm projects that are you know, really pushing some boundaries and things. And, and you touched a little bit on, I think, at the start about this project. I, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more to sort of how how it kind of came to be. And um, um, I think there was a competition. Um, and and then also, I mean, you mentioned a few times on the way through that you had a, a, a I guess, a private client, um, which I guess in, in the context of, for, for us is, is a bit um, an unusual, given that we don't really have a kind of culture of, of that sort of thing happening here. So you're absolutely correct that um, uh, when the, um, so a public agency, the Hudson River Park Trust, approached uh, an individual, his name is Barry Diller, uh, and asked him whether he'd be prepared to make a donation to the reconstruction of the pier that was destroyed. Um, they said, we would like you to make a, a, a donation of a pavilion, a performance pavilion. And so um, uh, Mr. Diller held his own uh, uh, competition. He invited three uh, people, Thomas Heatherwick, uh, Bjarke Engels, Engels, and um, Santiago Calatrava. And he uh, visited their work and he was um, particularly moved by um, uh, Thomas's uh, a pavilion in Singapore, which had the seeds, that really beautiful um, uh, pavilion. And so uh, uh, the donor selected Thomas Heatherwick. And at the beginning, the donor was asked to, to um, consider a donation of $37 million. And, um, and now that the project is complete, uh, it, it, the cost is $260 million. Um, the the uh, city of New York put in 17 million. So you can see the reason why uh, the donor was effectively the private client because um, uh, while we had to comport with all of the regulations of building on public property, and this is indeed a lease from the, the, the trust, uh, it is, um, I viewed the client and I think almost everybody else on the project viewed him as the client, even though we knew we had to play by the rules, so to mm. speak. Yeah, interesting. Um, we've got a few other ones here um, and maybe I might connect a couple of these up, but um, one, one here about how the drainage works, um, which I think is an interesting question. Um, and then also, I, I guess the sort of life expectancy of a, of a project like this in terms of, um, I guess, you know, building out over water and, and um, those sorts of things. Well, both of those are, are great questions and they do tie together with what I mentioned uh, right off the bat about playing by the rules. Uh, so uh, building in the river, the, the Hudson River is uh, considered a, an estuary. Uh, it is tidal uh, and it has a, quite a rich marine habitat. Uh, and it is regulated uh, by the Department of Environmental Conservation. And so as uh, uh, to that end, uh, we are not allowed to use any chemicals, fertilizers, de-icing salts, pesticides, uh, or organic fertilizers. Um, and so the water drains directly into the river. It passes through our, our soil. Uh, it is able to pass through the geofoam. And then the drains are located essentially where the pots intersect. Um, and so it comes down at the intersection of the pots directly into the river, which is why we have to um, uh, be strict about what uh, we can um, use on the project. So that, that's how the drainage works. Um, in terms of the uh, lifespan, uh, 
it is a requirement by Hudson River Park Trust that all of the piers be designed for a 50-year uh, life, which is considered to be um, uh, the life of concrete in saline water. Yeah. You can extend that life uh, through some uh, drastic means, uh, but I would say that I would expect that this pier could last as long as 70, 75 years, but at some point it will deteriorate. Mm. Got an interesting kind of follow up to that here, which is about, you know, is, is there a sort of sustainability rating or, or target that the project was, was looking at? Or? Sustainability in uh, longevity or yeah. reuse well, of the I guess materials? In, just, in terms of perhaps the, you know, thinking about carbon footprints and um, um, emissions oh. and that sort of embodied energy and those kind of things. Well, uh, problem number one would be concrete. <laughs> and uh, we have a lot of it on this, uh, on this structure. Um, I will say that um, I had no control over that, uh, but what we did have control over, um, we were, uh, I think we did a pretty good job by keeping everything within about a 200 mile radius uh, for travel distance from the nurseries, uh, from the stone quarry, uh, and the and the lumber mills, um, and using uh, as I said locally uh, supplied materials. The plants were uh, the the perennials and grasses were custom grown. Um, the the trees obviously were not. Um, the uh, we were able to use a marine transport for a lot of the uh, a lot of the materials. Uh, all of the all of the pots did come down the Hudson River. They were not trucked, uh, so that was a that was a good thing. Uh, the soils are are um, manufactured; they are not stripped from uh, you know uh, virgin land. Um, so I would say that there was uh, you know some attempt on our part to uh, be responsible in that way. And um, but uh, the the you know Thomas and the donor. Had a vision and so mm. yeah great and maybe we've got time for one more i think um uh, maybe i'll try and combine a couple too but I mean, obviously there was a it's great to see a project with such a thoughtful and, and sort of complex um planting strategy and um i guess there's probably some challenges around um achieving that i know it's sometimes difficult in, in our context um and, and i guess related to that perhaps i i guess a lot of this comes back perhaps to the initial concept of a, 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 a leaf floating in the water um, and um, like as, a, as an idea that presumably follows through into the creation of a, of a garden more generally. Well, I think, you know, I, I would be interested if you're ever, ever able to come and visit it, whether you think of it as a park or whether you think of it as a park with a garden or a garden that is a park uh, and I know that sounds a bit hair splitting, but um, I think a lot of people have come to really appreciate the landscape for what it is, uh, and that that it really is a strolling garden in a in a very Asian kind of way. It, it's a it's a strolling garden. You know, there's no basketball courts, there's no playground. Uh, it is a it is a place that you just hopefully uh, you smile as you leave. <laughs> You might come in kind of nerve wracked, but hopefully you leave feeling calmer and hopefully a bit um, happier. All right, it's fantastic. Look, thank you very much, um, Signe, and um, what a fascinating project. I hope um, everyone really enjoyed that. Um, we're out of time, so um, thank you. Thank you once again, and um, thank you to our sponsors. Um, Streetscape. Um, and uh, for those who are still on the line, um, just a, a gentle reminder that um, uh, call for abstracts for our next year's conference um, closing shortly. So um, we're, we're hoping to, to get some of those through from, from people in the next little while. So um, thank you for coming along and um, see you all again soon. I just want to say if anyone has questions that were not answered, and I apologize for running over, uh, you can find my email. Uh, on our website and don't hesitate to reach out. So thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.
Bye.